Welcome back, everyone, to Running on Empty. Not a description of how senior figures in the TV industry feel after the Gen X presentation, but um, uh, a look at the um, rich and diverse area of formatted entertainment. Um, I have to say, coming to this, I had that question, which is, are we going to take some uh, experienced people, go round the roundabout, and end up saying we need some hits and everything's fine? Having dug into uh, the, 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 the data a little bit and had to think about the market. Well, I'm kind of up for that. Yeah, uh, w Tim, well, you can contribute at that level. Um, but the, the, what we will do is, I think, face us, be faced with a bit of a puzzle. And I think the, 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 it is a puzzling point for this genre. I think if you're looking at it, there's no shortage of good news. And I'm going to ask the uh, esteemed panel to get stuck in a, mi in a minute. But actually, 18 out of 20 of the top performing original programs on broadcast TV in the US this summer were, guess what, not must-see drama but formatted entertainment, 18 out of 20 in terms of original hits. Um, SVODs, of course, warming up their engines. We see them coming in, rhythm and flow with Netflix, American Idol, it's all, it's all there for the taking. And if you were feeling depressed about new ideas, then 30 new formats of the top list were developed in the last five years. So we can go after that. But if you look at it on the other side, there's certainly a degree of worry in the market. The share of hits coming out of the UK is still very strong, but marginally declining, and off its historic highs. There'll be some, we've already started arguing about that in the corridor, so we'll, we'll get into that. And we're certainly not the fastest growing market. There's a sense that the failure rate among broadcasters is, is high, and the stakes are quite high. That classic case of risk aversion, are we at a peak point? And also the SVODs, while commissioning, they're yet to really embrace the genre. And let's face it, when you go and meet them, must have big dramas, and those defining docs are probably where you're more likely to be talking at this point in our history. So is it game over or game on? What I'm gonna do is hand over to um, the panel and give them five minutes or so, a few minutes each, just to lay out the stall, and then we'll get stuck in, and then obviously I'll hand over to the audience so we can have some questions. Just in terms of our panel, we're incredibly lucky to have uh, a, a, a group, a trio here, when I was looking at it, in terms of the amount of formatted entertainment that they've been responsible for. Obviously, Alex Mann, CEO, CEO of Channel 4 since 2017, previously at the Foundry, but before that, uh, since eight years at Shine, three years as CEO, so welcome, Alex. Um, Tim Hinks, co-CEO of The Wonderful Expectation, uh, declaration of interest, we have a little share as BBC Studios. Um, we don't interfere that much. Um, but a new start, a start up with this Peter Fincham. the first time I've seen you for about three years. It's lovely to see you yeah. again, Tim. So. <laughs> it, was, it was check and go, basically. Um, uh, obviously, before that, um, Tim uh, was responsible from, uh, from Big Brother to Deal or No Deal and many, many hundreds of programs besides as CEO and president of Endemol, oversaw numerous international mega hits and previously a producer. And finally... Hmm? You were CEO. Was I CEO? He's, he's moved to co-CEO now. Right. So at Endemol. Let's not, yeah. And then I, we got... I think, <laughs> I think this, is, this is an important debate to be had. You're not what meant my to be surprised was. by the I, others' biogs, by the way, Stephen. But right. anyway, keeping... The, and of course, Stephen Lambert at the end, <laughs> um, CEO uh, um, uh, of... You're a CEO. Studio Lambert. <laughs> Right. Uh, goggle box, race across the world, the circle, it's, it's endless, it kind of lists, I was amazed uh, this morning looking through all the work you've done so um, uh, wonderfully over the last few years. But I think Stephen, as, you know, as someone who's really always been um, uh, at the forefront of innovating, pushing, pushing the boundaries, Emmys, BAFTAs, and before that, of course, Chief Creative Officer at RDF, and 15 years at the BBC. So thank you all for coming to discuss formatted entertainment. I'm gonna hand over now to Alex, who can set the scene. Thanks, Tim. I think I've got a couple of magical slides. Or a picture of you, Tim. Uh, so there's a couple of slides which are magically going to come up, which just look at what's happening in the market. So first of all, um, if you look here at the number of scripted shows that have been on over the past 10 years, what you see is about a doubling in the US from about 250 a year to 500 a year. So over that period, less than a decade, a doubling of the amount of content in the market as you see, they're driven by the online services and the SVOD streamers. Um, second slide uh, is at the same time, how many formats, they're up here now, Stephen. Yeah. 
they've got it working. Um, how many formats, in terms of formats that have traveled around the world that have been very significant, have there been across the past 40 or 50 years? Family Feud, which I'm sure you're all watching on a day-to-day -day basis, launched in the 1970s. Um, these, are sh these are shows that have been to more than 45 territories. And you'll see that the last three that we had at that scale were all launched about 2010. Minute to win it, money drop, and the voice. Before that, in the 10 years, we had Idols, we had Deal or No Deal, X Factor, Big Brother, of course, MasterChef Got Talent, things that went super wide and traveled around the world to multiple tens of territories and were remade. So everything that the non-scripted format business was built off. Um, these two things have happened at once. We have had a massive rise in scripted, and we haven't seen a format that's traveled to that scale. Things have traveled to 10 territories, they've traveled to 20 territories, but nothing that has traveled that far, and things that have traveled have become more expensive and more difficult to make. But broadcasters globally are looking for those hits that can go around the world super fast, and where success is to some degree guaranteed because of the amount of repeatability that we've seen in other territories. Um, traditionally, we've had um, video on demand, subscription video on demand, only focusing on scripted, but if you look at the next slide, you'll see that that's changing. So this is the number of hours of reality shows that have been commissioned over the past couple of years by Amazon Prime and Netflix, and you'll see that from a base of very, very low, that's starting to grow quite dramatically, and we'll see how that goes in the next few years. So just in terms of lay of the land before we get to whether there's a problem or not, and um, we've seen this massive rise in scripted, we have seen a decline in massively significant formats that have gone to 40 plus territories. So the question is, will that change, or is there a reason that things aren't being invented that go to that volume of places. Okay, thank you, Alex. So, Alex outlines a problem. What, Stephen, where are you? Well, I had some nice graphs, but I wasn't allowed to show mine. Um, <laughs> the, I think the key thing about the second graph, or the second slide, was that the one up the corner there, the, the most recent 2010s, it wasn't that long ago, and it takes quite a while for these shows. They don't go straight from naught to 50 or 60 territories. It takes many, many years to get to that point. And if you look at shows, because in my side I would have shown you, that um, <laughs> I would have shown you that many of the formats that have been launched since then are doing exactly the same in terms of the number of territories they're going into is building all the time. Our own show, Gogglebox, is now at 38. Uh, Your Face Sounds Familiar, now at 39. Anything Goes, a French format, now at 25. Uh, the the um, uh, Married at First Sight, which is huge in Australia, uh, now at 35. Um, and these are all much more recent than all the ones on that, on that chart. So I think the point is, is that it takes time to go to territories. You launch a show, People want to see whether it's, so some, some of the territories come in, but a lot of territories are very cautious, and it just takes five, 10, sometimes 15 years before you actually see what the real value is in, in, in a format and how, how many territories will embrace it. And I don't actually see that there's a, there's a big problem. The other chart that I was amazed by, and I can't actually believe, is that last one. I don't believe that Netflix is reducing the number of uh, reality shows it's buying. That, I, I don't know where you got that data from, but I, it's astounding to me. I also can't believe that Netflix is commissioning fewer reality shows than Amazon, because I would be astounded if that was true. Um, so I don't actually think there's a big problem. I think it all takes time, um, and I think that the broadcasters need to be very brave, because it's a huge gamble going for these shows, the big shows. Although sometimes what can be actually a big show starts off small and grows into something big. I don't think people thought that MasterChef was going to be a huge show. I don't think that Come Dine With Me was thought that that was going to be a huge show. I don't think anybody thought that Gogglebox would become a show. When we first sold that show to Channel 4, I had a meeting with all three international, our distributor, and I had to apologize to them. I said, I'm sorry we've, bought this, we've sold this show. I can't imagine you'll sell it anywhere. It's now their most widely selling format. So, Often you don't know what's going to become the hit, but when it comes to the show that is the obvious, big, expensive gamble, it's really difficult for broadcasters, and I think that sticking with shows that show that they have the potential to go big is, is really what it's all about for broadcasters. And so I'm delighted that Channel 4 have agreed and went big 
in the second series of The Circle. And I'd just like to play a clip that will tell people about The Circle using Gogglebox. On Tuesday night, Channel 4 launched something quite unexpected. I've been wanting to see this. I know you've been, you'll have to tell me about it because I don't understand it. Nothing and no one is quite what they seem in The Circle. What is The Circle? I have seen adverts for this. Tonight, the first eight players move into this building. They can't be trapped in a block of flats. Why not? Have they agreed to that? Yes. They can't see or hear one another. They never meet their competitors face to face while playing the game. Instead, to win a cash prize of £50,000, they communicate only through our specially designed social media platform. What about food? Well, I suppose it comes through a chute. Can you well, shoot? Yeah, or a hatch. In the programme, they introduced us to a bubbly blonde. Hi, my name's Kate. I'm 25 from London. Oh, she seemed nice, didn't she? I'm here to win the money. What do you mean, what do you mean? Oh, look at that photo of her, that's beautiful. That's why I've decided to separate myself from my looks and my personality. personality. And play someone completely different. <laughs> what? What? That's not me. My name's Alex. <gasps> oh. The pictures I will be using to represent Kate are those of my girlfriend. So he's gonna be air? He's gonna be Kate. This is called oh. catfishing. Thank you, Stephen. Tim, where um, are you at in the um, so great debate? I had some slides, um, <laughs> which made me look really good, and I wasn't allowed to use them either. Um, but I think what I would, I think a couple of things I would observe, we're you know, obviously starting off a new company, so we're at the beginning of our journey, and non-scripted formats and otherwise incredibly important to us. I think a couple of observations. Um, one is, I don't think we should shy away from a bit of context here, which is non-scripted is definitely mm. the slightly embarrassing step kid to the posh world of telly and the people that run it. It always has been, um, despite it being an extraordinary business model and shaping the lives of people that watch it um, and that it's a, it provides extraordinary drama. It's always been a bit embarrassing. And I certainly remember at Endemol, people would, for example, much rather talk about Black Mirror than, let me think, for example, help my dog is as fat as me, for example. <laughs> um, that, it came up, um, including, I should admit, yeah, yeah. the people who made help my dog is fat as fat as me. <laughs> it has to be said. Um, so I think there's always been that slight sense of it being a, a, um, a sort of lesser thing, um, which is why it's a great opportunity to, to discuss it at such an august occasion. I think the other thing um, to say is that um, the scripted, so the big boom in scripted that we saw in that now very controversial slide about how many uh, shows were, 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 have been commissioned and scripted has been incredibly good for non-scripted. I think it's, been, it's, it's really, really important that we acknowledge that. I think the, the, the production values and quality and sheer scale of some of the scripted now, particularly obviously SVOD scripted, but not exclusively, has raised everyone's game. And I do remember in the 2000s when it was sort of the other way around and everyone was sort of saying Big Brother and others were crowding out scripted right. and there were no stories to tell because they were being right. told by young working class people on, on Channel 4, um, plus, plus a change. And I think that um, th that has now sort of flipped <laughs> fully, as a grower, that one. Yeah. That has flipped, um, but it's not that funny. So I think that's about as far as it will grow. Um, it's, it's now flipped around and I think those of us who, I mean, we do drama as well, but, but as you're in non-scripted, I think that the, the, the production values you need to achieve and the sheer depth of, of storytelling, I think there's a real challenge for us because I think when you go home or wherever you happen to be and you decide to watch something, choosing between Game of Thrones, say, and a cookery competition, right. uh, you know, it would, would seem to be an unfair fight, but it doesn't need to be if those things are made brilliantly. I think another couple of things to say is, I think the UK is still the home of risk in non-scripted. I think it's still a place where you can go and take something on a piece of paper, an idea, and sell it. And that's as true now as it's always been. I think there are challenges, you know, but I think that's still a very fundamental thing that we should celebrate. Um, also, uh, this morning, um, I'm not going to go through my whole day, but this morning <laughs> I, um, I was at a streaming service um, who, where we're making a non-scripted show. Um, and of course, you know, they are moving in decisively into that world. They are putting money behind it. They are expecting 
um, scale and all those things that we've talked about with scripted. And as a, as a new company, you know, the fact there are more buyers, I mean, literally buyers have appeared that didn't used to exist, um, is obviously very exciting. We could probably go into some of the sort of yeah. economic challenges yeah. of that. Yeah. But I think from where I used to be in a company that, to Stephen's point, was making shows which went around the world, 50, 60, 70 territories, that's a particular job, having a library of formats, trying to grow that, trying to maintain it. That's one particular job. And that didn't used to exist 10 years ago. That's a real job that someone has to do. Being a new company, being a creative company, trying to create new content you know, in the non-scripted world as well as scripted, it's a pretty exciting time. Um, but, but it is very different. And we're probably going to go into that in an incisive and interesting way in your next question. Thank you. <laughs> very insightful, also uh, uh, a very good analysis of your own performance as it went, so that's good. Yeah, yeah no, it's good to have a running commentary, that's right. So, In terms of the um, buyers, let's talk about that a little bit, and the commissioners, because, I mean, and, and we can take this from both sides. Alex, start with you a little bit, in terms of, um, if you take, I mean, uh, Stephen was very complimentary and, and, and uh, understandably so around the circle, but people said, you know, boy, that was brave, two seasons, you can, you know, and it's got to be a grower now. I've saw the announcements this morning that you're going to innovate on the keep going. For, how difficult is it, based on the pressures on linear TV now, to really make those decisions around backing things for the long term? Well, look, you heard um, Kevin Ligo say earlier, it's really difficult to launch new things, right? Yeah. So, you know, Channel Four is here to launch new things. That's our job is to build new brands and to innovate and do that. It's harder and harder for broadcasters. You heard him say it's better to kind of rinse an existing show and make it bigger and nurture it and care it. That is definitively true. But where does that come from? It comes from the fact that the audience is completely oversupplied. Great thing if you're the audience. Mm. So you have lower attention span when you go to choose something. So you either want to choose something that is guaranteed to be good or you won't give it much time, or you want to choose something that's familiar, because you know then what you're getting, and you go between those two modes, right? You often watch something, you binge watch it for a season, and then you go back to what you know a show is, whether that's Strictly, whether it's Bake Off, you know, you know what you're getting there. Um, that changes depending on how you feel, and it changes on day of the week and time of the day, depending on whether you want easy to watch. Um, so we have to react to that. So when you do make a decision to launch something new, like launching The Circle, that's a massive bet. Has it got worse? Really, I mean, what I'm interested in. It's got worse. It's, it's got, got harder. Worse. Yeah, because so if you look at launch rates for broadcasters and success rates against a lot of new shows, they're kind of down sub 50%. Last year ran across the UK market at kind of 30%. That's a low rate, but it's harder to market, right? You know, you got it, you heard from the like um, Generation Z earlier, it's harder to market, attention spans less, you've got to market on social, something's got to catch fire, it's got to be talked about. That said, People are watching more and more video and they're looking for innovation all the time. So they're just, they're two difficult things at the same time. So you've got to have things that capture people's imagination. You've got to work out how to market them smarter. I think that means probably everyone is launching less and they're nurturing it more. And if it means that if you launch, if you launch a new reality show, of which we were arguing about this backstage, but there probably hasn't been one in 15 years at that scale. There was one in Israel, you know, there's a couple. That haven't, that haven't necessarily traveled. So there hasn't been anything that's traveled like Stevens the Circle has done, because he's already made it for the US, for Netflix, he's making it for another couple of countries. The scale of the tens of millions of pounds big reality shows, they just don't exist, because right. it's so hard to do, and it's such a risk. Now, it's a bit easier for us, because we're here to take that kind of risk, right? We don't have a stock price. You know, we don't have to worry about that risk, um, but it's still really, really hard to do. It, it, Two questions for you guys is, is one is do you recognize that it has got to work? Because Stephen, you were a bit like, it's fine. Well, that's okay. We're, we're doing well. I mean, do you know what I mean? But, but are you seeing a structural difference with the broadcasters or not that makes it more difficult to get these things away? No, I think it's harder for them to... It's nothing's harder for him. I think it's harder for them to be more successful mm. with them because of the points that Alex is making. It's, as Tim was saying, there are more buyers for us. So in that sense, it's slightly easier because when you've got more buyers, there's a greater chance that one of them's going to buy your show. Um, and uh, it's not that I'm... I mean, I think that it, it was always difficult to sell a show, and it was always difficult to launch it. I mean, uh, Strictly Come Dancing, when they tried to sell that in America, it was rejected by everybody yeah, tell me about many it. times yeah. over. Millionaire and Survivor were both rejected by many, many on many, many occasions, and then the people involved in selling them just went back and back and eventually sold them. I mean, it's the same in scripts. I, yeah. I think it's easier to sell. I mean, in some ways, I think it's easier to sell now, which is sort of what you're saying. Are you saying that? Anyway, I'll say it. I'm saying it. It's easier to sell. And I think back then, I 
along with uh, Sir Peter Bazalgette, who's sitting in the second row, tried to sell deal or no deal on numerous multiple occasions, often to the same person, hoping they'd forgotten we'd already tried to sell it to them. <laughs> um, yeah. And sure, I took over and we have sold it. That's not the point. Um, um, that's, that's, that's a side issue and you've brought it up, Tim, and I can't deny it, but let's move on from that. But I think in those days, in, in some senses, you were creating a whole new genre, right, in right. some ways. And I think one of the things that scripted people in, script, in non-scripted development might think about, and I don't think this is just a UK issue, is, is, is the fact that you know, quite a lot of it's been made and it was, you know, shows like Wife Swap, Big Brother, whatever, you know, sort of created this genre. And there's a sort of slight feeling that occasionally you bump into that, well, all the good ideas have been done and you can't possibly, right. and it's a sort of toxic, you know, it's, and, and, and going back to the snobbery point, you know, no one says that in drama. No one's ever said that. You know, there are basically seven plots in drama, right? right. Uh, I made that up, but you know, there's, there's, a, there's a small number of plots, um, and Shakespeare did them all, so why bother after that? And, and of course, people have, rightly. Um, and, um, but in non-script, they say, well, we've had that, you know, we've had, and actually it's not true. I mean, the circle, annoyingly, um, is, is a brilliant construct and, and proves that you can take a big scale rea reality show um, for the place that, you know, it's backed Big Brother and, and make it feel fresh and new. So I think what we need, um, for what it's worth, in the buying side is, is actually that sense of excitement, of course, and openness, just on a creative level, to what the power of non-scripted. Um, I think we're both saying we don't see any evidence that isn't there, but of course, you, you, you occasionally do bump up uh, against people who sort of feel, you know, that it's less exciting than, 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 than say, drama. And I, and I think where the s fords are really interesting is that they feel very excited about it. You know, the interesting thing about those services is they feel like they're creating something new. And yes, we can argue about what, what the economics is and what's behind that. Do you think they uh, can, so I wanna, do, yeah. do you think, let's, let's move to the S-Falls a bit, because do you think they can break a show in the way that a linear broadcaster can, or in, in, well, in any way? I mean, I've heard Simon Fuller, for instance, talk that the, the network effects the, that you get through a live, a, a broadcast TV channel, how it markets, how it wants to be more porous. I mean, the, the very nature of the S-Files is a but walled I, garden. I genuinely think, I think the, the part of the answer is, that is, do they need to? You know, right. do, do we need them to? Because I think when you go back to those, you know, those early days of the two, you know, late 2000s, when, when I think actually some of the shows were going quite quickly into those multiple, to absolutely take the point, Stephen, but they were going quite quickly into multiple territories over a couple of years. Um, I, I think you could argue that, you know, unless you're a global producer who's reliant on that story continuing, if you're a smaller producer, then I'm not sure you necessarily need that to happen. What you need is to be able to make the best show you possibly can and for it to be marketed in a way that may not be a mass marketing, you know, operation as some of those as a pop idol or whatever. It may be somewhat more niche, but it can still have impact and still be in a fantastic but, business to be in. But there are, you know, inevitably international broadcasters, when we all used to go to Cannes to sell those shows, international broadcasters decline in the numbers that will take the risk to buy off paper. Right. And because um, everyone is expanding known brands because of what we talked about with the audience, there are less slots. So there are less places on traditional broadcasters right. to sell new paper formats into. You're right, Tim, those shows did travel super, super fast. And the shows that came after, in general, became more complicated or expensive to make in multiple places, something like the island. You know, it's expensive to set up, it's complicated to do. The rig shows, like One Born Every Minute, 24 Hours in a &E, they traveled, but they were more expensive uh, and complicated to do. We haven't seen an SVOD break a uh, non-scripted format like that, but it doesn't mean it won't happen. I mean, surely it's a, well, the level of funding what, what you, is a matter of time. What you're all saying is, I think, is that structurally there are less, through a combination of viewer habits, risk aversion, that there are few, fewer slots for fresh, original, formatted yeah. entertainment. On, Across that, the that's market. a big statement. I'm that's not, a, not sure that's I'm not sure we are saying. I don't know. But the buyer's, the buyer's saying that. The buyer's saying that. I don't, well, right, but, but there there I, I said on traditional broadcasters. Yeah, you then got the S-Bonds. Well, fine, even on traditional broadcasters, it was always difficult to get those slots. I mean, I think the unscripted boom of the 2000s had to push out a lot of declining sitcoms. Uh, the, it was the sitcom that vanished at almost <laughs> yeah, the same yeah. speed as which <laughs> unscripted grew. And that was because sitcoms stopped being funny. What does unscripted, what does formatted entertainment mean to push out? So what? W w what would you push out the schedules to get a bit more well, space I mean, for So it? now it's difficult because there are lots of established shows. I mean, I think the, 
the, the, the striking thing about all television is how much uh, inertia there is to establish brands, whether it's scripted or unscripted. Right. And you look at American broadcast television, where it's absolutely dominated in the unscripted space by very established brands. And every summer, the four networks attempt to launch a new one, and pretty much every summer, 99% of them fail. Yeah. Um, and yet, the old war horses, Survivor, um, uh, well, The Bachelor. Big Brother, uh, Bachelorette, they're all they're there. All there, all they're on the list, going. yeah. Just going back to the SVOD and the launch of a show, I think the, it is very interesting, because with Fast and Furious, the show that Netflix is about to launch for the first time, I think it's about the first time, they are launching it not in one go for that you can binge it from beginning to end. You mean rhythm and, rhythm and flow? I they're think. Put, rhythm and flow, sorry. Yeah. They're putting out it in three, across three weeks in batches. Indeed. And that'll, be, that'll generate a lot of data for them. It'll be interesting to see what, what they learn from that because clearly with, with art competition shows, uns, unscripted art competition shows, there is a lot of, let's talk about this now among the viewers, and we need to find out what's going to happen in the next episode. And people, part of the joy of watching them is the fact that everybody's in sync on the conversation. And I think the prob problem that uh, the SVODs have is when the, both their strength is also their weakness. By releasing everything at, all at once, and people watching it at different times, it's much harder to have that that, 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 that in sync dialogue with among the viewers. Indeed. And so I think it'll be interesting to see whether Netflix discovered that they can. Do you think they'll crack it? Because. It, yes. You think they will? Definitely. I do, yes. So, and I think and their I, ability you, to market You both is think enormous. they'll. Yeah, because there, there's clearly structural challenges for them in that, in terms of live and all the. And you, you talk to traditional TV executives, they will obviously put the, quite rightly the pitch around that connection with the audience, the live moment coming together. You think the SVODs are going to. I, I think. And truly get into that space and make it work. Yeah, and I, and, I, and, I, and I think, you know, don't, don't make no mistake, and by the way, they did, Amazon did, did that with the Grand Tour, of course. Yes, of course they did. They, did, yeah. uh, they sold, you know, put that out like a yeah. scheduled Never heard sh of it. show. <laughs> um, um, and, um, and, 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 you know, of course they will, it, um, and they're determined to, and there are more and more entrants in all the things we've said. We, we are, of course, I mean, I'm including you as utterly self-serving. Make no mistake about that. You know, we're looking at, we think it can all work. I can say uh, that. It, but it can all, it, we try to hide it, but it can all work. And, and of course, you know, the fact we've got more customers means, means you know, we, we, we're excited about the possibilities on a business level. But actually, I think it feels like some of the SVODs are beginning to think about how they innovate in script. Because on one level, the innovation is, well, let's schedule it, you know, and that feels like, well, we're all very comfortable with that. But actually, the messages we're getting feel that they, are, they have an ability to innovate and, and they want to do things slightly differently. And that's always welcome. And I'd say to, in the PSB world, you know, that you, you, you could say that what there is, is a, that, you know, there occasionally is a, little fe a feeling of a little bit of um, uh, lack, lack, lack of joy about this world of, of non-script. And occasionally you do, you do see that. And a sense that it can not be innovative. Not for me, you don't. Definitely not from you. Right. Um, and not from any of the buyers in this room, actually, Good. interestingly. <laughs> They've all been incredibly um, forward-thinking. Um, uh, but I think you want to feel that you, you, you know, it's an exciting genre to be in. Of course we would say that. I mean, interestingly, I use that in a qualified way. Mm. Um, interestingly, <laughs> um, as a new company, we've found oddly, dr I mean, maybe not oddly, but scripted has moved quite quick, because so I was just standing back from it, thinking about how mm. where we were at Endemol. Script has moved quite quickly, much quicker than I thought. And obviously, that's, that's, we know what's going on there. There's, there's a boom. There's a lot more money being put into it. But I think the fact that, that non-script takes time, as Stephen says, is not a new thing. Um, but and, there's also and, and, been and this structural shape. I'm going to get out to you, but the, there's a structural shape around, to Stephen's point, around what an SVOD service is and those players, uh, the very nature of that they're going to specific audiences, they're tuning it to get tighter and tighter relationships as opposed to broad relationships. They're less dependent on live. Are they, uh, do you feel they're going to get in your space? I think I, I see no reason why uh, a Netflix can't be successful with a non-scripted format. Of course they can. But I think you can easily crack day and date release pattern, right, in the way yeah. it's been done in the movies. You can crack that. Obviously, that's just a kind of window in question. So that's super easy. You can drop things in different countries on a certain date. Um, it's harder to crack the relevance of getting a piece of global content that fits to each country at scale. So in scripted, you can get um, 
an amazing piece of script, Casa de Papel, you can get that money heist, you can appeal to a slice of audience in 50 countries. And through appealing to a slice of audience who all feel the show appeals to them, you can get a huge mass audience, great. That is more complicated on an unscripted format to do because it involves the editorial decisions of who you cast to do that relevance. So that is harder to do, I would say, creatively, um, to do that to get the same level of buzz and mass entertainment about it. Now, that's probably a challenge much more than can you create something that people talk about at the same time, right? That's what national broadcasters focus much more on doing it. That sense of, can you make something that is relevant to a whole nation? I mean, you know, I, I, we haven't mentioned Love Island enough, but Love Island does do that to the whole nation at the same time. And that's what you heard from people, the young people who talked about social, right? It's, a, it's across social all the time and there's a pacing and an, an episodic nature to that which makes you want to watch it. That's harder to do when you're going global. But that leads to questions of what's the format and how you do it in different countries. I also, I also think there's a really uh, interesting thing happening which is about talent, which is not traditionally certainly where you'd, you'd think about formatted entertainment uh, being. And in fact, the sort of mantra in a way back in the day was, was about the sort of format is, is king and, 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 you know, and you talent. Might show the What's that? You might want to show oh, No, no, well, I wasn't going to necessarily move on to that, but, 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 but talent being, being incredibly important there. And I think that's a really good thing. I think, you know, we've made stuff um, where we've got young and diverse talent in, in, in sort of chat shows and vehicles, trying for out me, new for, for, for Channel 4 um, exclusively. And that feels exciting. Those aren't formats, but they're incredibly important ways of of breathing fire, I think, into that notion of w w what non-script it can be, getting it back in touch with, you know, the thing we're not perhaps touching on, but, but, but is, is, is there and thereabouts, is about the niche, about the, the, the SVODs and their, their sort of fetishization yeah. of the niche, and about how they can make money out of, like, very targeted right. audiences. And obviously, that's a great thing for us, uh, for, for producers, if you've got the right content. It's harder for the traditional broadcasters. It's a harder thing, because they need, ultimately need broad, even if for Channel 4, you need sort of broad. But I think there's a mixed ecology there that you, you can get at. And I think that it feels like there is excitement around attracting talent to, 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 uh, into the non-scripted world for the first time in, in, in a long while and, and, and sort of getting a younger sensibility to some of that. So well, I don't know. Wait, wait, hang on, I don't understand a word of that. No, why, I didn't know myself, but I listened to it and thought... Why is well, it I, difficult to... Why is it different yeah. attracting talent into the unscripted world now to what it's always been? There's lots think, and lots of shows have attracted yeah, talent. I, I couldn't quite see where the sentence was going, but I think there's something <laughs> in it, so let me revisit it. Um, I think that the excitement for, for me is that it's not just about formats. It's about attracting new talent to audiences who want to create a buzz away from drama. So things like we do, like Mo Gilligan or Big Nasty Show for Channel 4, create a buzz and excitement that frankly speaks to a bigger thing which is about the economic model here. Non-scripted is cheaper than right. drama. And right. I think we should get, you know, move into that as I move away from the point that I haven't quite made. And you can scale which, it. But that's always is, been is, the case. It is, Unscripted I, always right. did attract the new talent and provided them... Right, uh, but I think drama, which is now in the ascendancy and is a very positive thing, um, is in causing extraordinary inflation wherever we look. Inflation yes. for producers, inflation for talent. Non-scripted doesn't quite have that problem, right? Right. And I think there's a sort of slightly re... I think people are rediscovering that and understanding that you can create... Um, you know, you can bring talented people to a channel or to a service um, in a way that doesn't cost you 10 million quid a, a throw. And that feels like, a, like a, an exciting place to be. And again. it's certainly something um, the SVODs have even been right. uh, public about, that over time is their content yeah. investment yeah. has to make sense yeah. that th some of these unscripted formats are yeah. going to be where the action is. Right. I'm, I'm going to turn to the audience in uh, a, a minute. Um, just in terms of the, this question I kind of posed at the beginning about, about the UK, because obviously we've had, yeah, the BBC One and ITV One have been the, the mainstays historically. We've got the digital channels and Channel 4, obviously, um, doing it. I mean, interesting, Love Island came through ITV Two, took two seasons to grow to Stephen's point. Um, do you think that's restricting the UK a little bit in terms of structurally, we just haven't got the slots, so others are coming in? I mean, Israel, the, now the fastest developing territory. Has the UK got something to worry about, or is it me just flapping? I don't think the UK has anything to worry about in the sense that it's still the biggest home for new formats. Uh, more new formats are created in the UK that then go globally. I think that structurally we've got as a result of the whole way in which our industry has grown up, an extraordinary uh, priority for, or an imperative on our buyers to buy original paper ideas, the very opposite in 
to what it is in many other countries. You know, the Germans won't buy a format until they can see the data of exactly. how well it's done everywhere else. That's a huge trend for us, isn't it? Huge. Uh, it, 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 I think that we have the amazing advantage of the English language. And, uh, you know, in the end, the, if, uh, what for all of us is the goal in the format world is to create a format here and take it to America. If it works in America, it's probably going to go everywhere. Um, it's so much easier selling a, an original format that you've made in the UK to the Americans because it's in English. Um, and I think that we have got a lot of very, uh, we've got a, a, a large independent production community uh, creating ideas and seeing more opportunities than ever. Great. We're going we're gonna to hand to the audience then. Because we've had accusations of censorship, I'm going to let Tim show, close us out with a little bit of film, because it's always oh. nice to see something. But after we've right, done a couple of questions, sorry. and then I'll let you close, Tim. Has anyone got a question for the panel in terms of where we're at? If they haven't, we will... No? Thank yeah, you. one at the back. Thank you. Broadcast. Watch out. Yeah, if you can just tell us where you're from. I've got an idea. That sounds ominous. Um, hi, Chris Curtis from Broadcast. Um, you touched on it at the end there, Stephen, um, talking about uh, creating formats in the UK and um, then exporting them. Um, but both you and Tim have been effusive about the opportunities offered by the SVODs. Um, what's the capacity for um, striking uh, decent deals with rights uh, with the SVODs in the sense that um, I'm thinking about work for hire versus um, uh, terms of trade, etc. I'm not asking my question terribly well. Uh, the short version is, would you rather create a show um, with small production margin for a British broadcaster with the potential of exporting it, or um, sell everything to Netflix but get a really healthy production margin? I think the ideal world is to create a show for anybody where you can make other versions of it, um, either by selling the format to other producers or broadcasters, or to be able to make it yourself. Um, you're, we're, we're in the business of trying to create IP, and, and then to be able to, 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 to unlock the value of that IP in whatever form. And I think that um, the, 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 the SFODs are aware of the need to make them an attractive place to take IP. Uh, I mean, we're making three versions of the circle, uh, an American version, a French version, and a Brazilian version. Uh, and we've got all these different nationalities coming to our building in the UK to, 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 to make the show, uh, as well as Brits coming to make the, the, the Channel 4 version. That is a wonderful way in which it can work with an SVOD. The difficulty is that they've got to see that working. I mean, they've, they're, they're making different versions of Nailed It, which is one of their most successful, although not particularly expensive shows, and they're making different national versions of that. If, if they can see with these experiments that commissioning different versions for their different areas of the world where they operate works, then I think that they offer something that can run a parallel to the conventional format you industry. You think you can, you're muscular enough to hold some of the IP, what is, is basically what you're saying, Steve. Well, that you can insist that, uh, that, that, that if this is an idea that they want to make other versions of it, that you um, get first choice to make it, and that you certainly get a financial reward. But in that case, reward. you made it for Channel 4 first, right? What? So you had the IP because you made the first version for Channel 4 on the circle, right? So, you, made the, you, you, made, kept, you kept the IP, you kept the you IP Channel 4 was the Because you made yeah, it for Channel 4 But we've, gone to, we've, we've sold other shows to SVODs where we've got a similar arrangement. Tim, last word for uh, you, well, you, I, can, you, you can link to your film nicely well, is it, this, it's, but, it's yeah, important. Please, and then we'll close. I, I think we've, if you remember, Chris, and indeed anyone, uh, a, a show called Beastmaster, which is on Netflix, that, I think that was like a couple of years ago. Yep. And that was a sort of, felt like, okay, something new is happening because they brought contestants and competitors from around the world, and it felt like we're going to be this one-stop sort of global format. And, and that feels like an awful lot of time has passed since then because that's not, I think, how they're thinking about it now. 
that what they're thinking much more about is, is, is the more natural order of things, which is how you do bespoke stuff for, for, for different territories. There is absolutely 100% a business to be built on that. Whether, where that's going over five or 10 years you, is- You will retain it, rights. And you, and, and you will retain rights. I mean, I think, look, good I mean, by the way, by the way, it's not now, but by the way, it's not now as binary as, you know, you've got the PSBs where you get yeah. the rights. Yeah, it's just that world has moved on. And one thing we haven't touched on is the notion that people talk about scripted being deficit funded. Non-scripted is now deficit funded. In, in to a large degree, that is absolutely fundamental change to, from five years ago, frankly, and certainly 10. And I think that brings up all sorts of rights issues that mean it's no longer uh, as simple as it once was. And, and you know, if you're a smaller company, those things focus your mind. And what they make you realize is you've got to play the numbers game. You've got to be in business with, of course, as many people as possible with, with, with um, uh, content that you're proud of. And the mixed model that you have outlined in your precise brief question, Chris, uh, is one we salute and, and recognize and, and want more of. Thank you, thank, for, thank, th you Chris. thank you very much. I'm going to say uh, two things, actually. One is thank you very much to the panel for doing um, a rather engaging session. And also, um, before we sign out, we, we'll, we'll watch the film just as a link through to the next, next session. Do you want to pitch it, please? Now. Yeah. Um, I wasn't getting obsessed about playing this, but know. this was just an example of something called the Chef's Brigade. Um, well, it's not an example of something called the Chef's Brigade. It is the Chef's Brigade um, uh, for BBC Two. And the point which I made about six hours ago was that um, the, scr the scripted boom has made producers, I think, think about layering content in more complex and interesting ways. And so we made this very happily for BBC Two with a chef called Jason Atherton. But nothing to do with me. The team that made it, I felt, made it beautifully. And they made it in a way that sort of when I looked at it, I thought, I'm not sure we would quite have made it that way before the, before the, the, the drama boom and the SVODs. It's a sort of trail for it from BBC Two, so it doesn't tell you an awful lot. But please do clap at the end, because it'll make me feel good if you do. Thank so you very much. 30 seconds. Thank you very much, and then we'll hand to Julie after, after that. Thanks, thanks guys.